right, so tonight we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and salvation. If you would, please go ahead and open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. And this should be a pretty well-known passage to nearly everybody. Uh, but we're going to read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. You know, growing up, I um, sort of understood God the Father, and I definitely understood God the Son, but God the Holy Spirit was always kind of a mystery, and I guess it's because I can imagine a father and I can imagine a son, but it was tough to imagine a spirit. You know, people used to refer to the Spirit in a lot of different ways when I was growing up, too. Uh, I guess uh, sometimes we say God's grace when we mean the Holy Spirit. Uh, people used to refer to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Ghost. Um, I didn't ever care much for that, because then the Holy Spirit seemed pretty scary. You know, was he like Casper, a friendly ghost, or what kind of ghost was he? Um, I also think a lot of the times I didn't hear about the Holy Spirit is because we tend to overreact to things. Um, of course, uh, rightfully so in some cases, as uh, I grew up more Southern Baptist than you can possibly imagine, but you know, also happening in the 20th century was the Pentecostal movement. And I think maybe sometimes even as our overreaction to that movement, uh, in the churches that I grew up in, we tended to de-emphasize the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't until I was about 20 or 21, I know that's, I guess that's late in life for me, where God started really piquing my curiosity about the Holy Spirit. You know, I think it's important to sort of pick up where we left off. Last week we talked about the Holy Spirit's role in creation. And the reason I think this is important is because that's the Holy Spirit's role even now. Is the Holy Spirit is, in the name of one really good book on the topic, it's God's empowering presence. The Holy Spirit is God, but the Holy Spirit's role is to function as God's sort of a moving presence among us. And he does that through creation, like we learned about last week, but also the Holy Spirit in terms of salvation is responsible for new creation. Um, we see in the Old Testament that God's Spirit uh, hovered over the face of the waters, and that God's Spirit, uh, whenever God spoke, uh, the Spirit moved and created. Uh, we see that men and women were given spirit, and because we were given spirit, we were instructed to create also. But of course we sinned, and we didn't create. But there was a promise. There was a promise, uh, the proto evangelion or the promise that there would come one from Adam and Eve, from the descendant of Eve, who would crush the heel of the serpent and set everything right. And I think if we read the Old Testament rightly, we should read it not as though we have already heard it, but we should always read it as though we're hearing it for the first time. And one of the first questions that would appear to us if we were reading it for the first time is, who will be the one that will do this role of setting everything right, and who will be the one who will reset and fix creation? You know, we think maybe, first off, if you read the Old Testament, you think maybe it's going to be Cain, but... Cain, instead of crushing the serpent, crushes his brother. And we have, of course, the first murder. When you read through the rest of the Old Testament, we have people, uh, Moses, 
David, Abraham, Jacob, and maybe some of these people were empowered by the Spirit, but some of them weren't. But some of them were, and they were empowered by the Spirit, but it was only, only for a time. But God promised that there would come a time where there would be one upon whose Spirit would reside. And not only would His Spirit reside on this one, but that His Spirit would reside on all people. Probably one of the most prominent verses about this is Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 11. It's a dry bones segment. But God says this. It says, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from the graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you will live. And I will place you in your own land, then you will know that I am the Lord. So God's spirit was a coming promise. God's spirit was, almost promi- was also promised by Joel. In the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, we read, And it will come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And of course, this happened with the church. Peter uses this very verse in Acts chapter 2 in one of the first sermons. And because the Spirit was poured out, the response of the crowd, due to the Spirit's leading, was conviction, repentance, and baptism. You know, when we study the Holy Spirit, I'm going to get to Ephesians 2, but I kind of want to spend some time in the Gospels. You know, what did G- what are the Gospels, what did the Gospels have to say about the Spirit. And to do that, I think we need to, I want to go through the Gospel of John. And I want to go to the Gospel of John kind of reading backwards to see how the promise of the coming Spirit was connected to the ministry of Jesus. And it's interesting how John does this in his Gospel in some very detailed, sometimes forward, but also sometimes sort of hidden ways. Or they were hidden unless you know your own testament. In John chapter 8, verses 31 through 59, there's a debate between Jesus and the Jews. And the debate is centered on this, who are the real people of Israel? The Jews have Abraham as their father. But in John chapter 8, 39, Jesus says, if you were children of Abraham, you would do the works of Abraham. And what are the works of Abraham? Well, Jesus says it was to believe in him who was sent. So if you understand the scriptures Jesus teaches, you would understand about him. And at the same time, Jesus teaches that in order to understand the scriptures, you need to know him. So you can't understand the scriptures without knowing Jesus. But only through knowing Jesus can you understand the scriptures. And to us, that somehow seems like a circular argument. It seems like a weird argument. But Jesus is saying that Abraham, and he says in this passage, that Abraham is a witness to Jesus. And by doing this, he connects Israel's story, or the Old Testament story, and the promise of the coming Holy Spirit to himself, to the person of Jesus Christ. Not only does John's gospel uh, point Jesus as the new sort of Abraham, but in John chapter 4, backing up, going backwards, Jesus is represented as sort of a new Jacob. You see, at the end of John, or in John chapter 4, is the story of Jesus meeting the woman at the well. Uh, But it's Jacob's well. And what's going on here, if you know your Old Testament, is there was a woman who was at the well that was asked by Jacob to give a drink, and that woman would be Rachel. Rachel. And here, Jesus is reenacting this, but showing that he's greater than Jacob. And instead of asking the Samaritan woman for a relationship that has something to do with marriage, he emphasizes to her a relationship that can only come through him. And Jesus says this, that if you knew who it was who asked you for a drink, you would ask and you would receive it. And he says, but I will give you waters, living waters that will have you thirst no more. 
And of course, living waters in John's gospel refers to the Holy Spirit. So to enter a relationship with me, the one who is greater than Jacob, and again, this promise of the Spirit is connected to the whole Old Testament story of Israel, Jesus says, ask, you have to ask me, and then I will give you the Spirit. Backing up from Jacob in John chapter 3, Jesus connects himself with Moses. He connects himself with Moses. And he does this again in a discussion of the Holy Spirit. He admits, you guys know the story, or many of you know the story, of Jesus' debate with Nicodemus. And Jesus says, Nicodemus, and you know, Nicodemus, uh, to, know, uh, to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. And Nicodemus gives either an honest answer or a sarcastic answer. Uh, we don't really know the tone, but either way, he kind of, he definitely gets it wrong and says, how can a man enter his mother's womb and be born for a second time? And Jesus says, it shouldn't surprise you that I said you must be born again because you should be born of water and the spirit. The spirit moves wherever it wants. And the reason it shouldn't have surprised Nicodemus is, again, because God's promise in the Old Testament that there will come a time upon one person who he's given the Holy Spirit, and through that person, the Holy Spirit will break through to everybody else. And so Jesus is making the point, again, that he's that person through whom the Holy Spirit has come. And then John connects the Holy Spirit all the way back, of course, to Genesis chapter 1, in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So in echoing Genesis chapter 1, he brings to mind of the reader the fact that the Spirit of God was responsible for animating and for creation. And in the same way, Jesus Christ is the one who has come to begin the project of new creation. Well, if that was confusing, I hope it wasn't. <laughs> Let's just go back to Ephesians. So Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, again, Paul doesn't go to Ephesians 2 without Ephesians 1. And in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul uses all kinds of terms that just have to do in the Old Testament with Israel. And again, he's doing this for a reason, because he's trying to teach, show the Ephesian church that all the promises of God have been met through the person of Jesus Christ, that this new kingdom life, the outpouring of the Spirit, all those things have been fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. But in Ephesians chapter 1, he does this by using terms that traditionally had only been connected with Israel. He uses words like, Adopted, predestined, chosen, being for his glory, redeemed, that they would be given wisdom and insight. Again, if you, if you remember in the garden, you're supposed to have knowledge of good and evil. Um, and of course, this didn't play out right, but God promises people there would come whenever the Holy Spirit came, whenever God came back to earth, that there would be a time where they would receive wisdom and insight that they were revealed mysteries. And he uses the other term, inheritance. And why does he do that? Well, because we don't want to disconnect the role of the Holy Spirit's ministry and conversion from, again, from God's promises in the Old Testament. And you're like, why is that so important? Why do you keep saying that? Because I think if we're going to fully understand what God has done in our conversion what God has done through the person of Jesus Christ. Man, it is so much more special to me than when I realize it's not just about me as an individual, but it's about the promises God gave all the way back in the very beginning. And we get to see those as followers, see those fulfilled as far followers of Jesus Christ. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. 
It's, the Bible says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. If we're going to understand what the Holy Spirit has done in our salvation, we need to understand our state before God prior to salvation. Um, the word for dead in Greek is thanatos. And I'm going to shock you because in Greek that word really means dead. All right? It means dead. That's a terrible pastor joke that every pastor does, and usually when they do it, I don't like it. And for some reason, I worked it in. But dead means dead. And what do dead things do? Not a thing. Listen, not one thing. Dead means there's no life within you. Dead means you have no sense of awareness about you. Dead means you can't make any decisions about right or wrong. Dead means you can't, you don't really weigh the real truth about good and bad. Dead in trespasses and sins means that all you do is trespass and sin. Why? Because you live as part of the kingdom of death. It says after that that we used to follow the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons at disobedience. Dead people only have one choice. Before Christ, we only had one choice, and that was to disobey and do wrong. You know, it always surprises me that we get so surprised when sinners act like sinners. You know, a lot of times growing up in church, you always hear people talking about, man, the world. I just can't believe what's going on out in the world. Well, yeah, you can. If you understand the gospel, yeah, you can. You know what the solution to that is? It's not passing more laws. You know what the solution to that is? It's not some picket signs. You know what the solution to that is? The only solution is the gospel. Because people that are lost are going to do lost things. They're going to reach false conclusions. They're going to do wrong. Why? Because they're dead, and that's all that they can do. That is the only ability that they have is to live a dead life. You know, uh, culturally speaking, uh, back a few years ago, there was a show that became real popular called The Walking Dead, right? And I don't know if any of y'all watched that. Um, I didn't because, you know, I don't know, it just wasn't my vibe. But it was all about zombies, right? It's all about zombies. And, and back like a decade, 15 years ago, I don't know why, but just zombies started sort of peering up in culture, right? And, but I think that there's something interesting about this idea of zombies is it's pretty close to the truth. Because that's the state of somebody who's lost. They're animated, they're moving, but they're not really self-aware. They don't really have life within them, right? There's something inside that is broken, that is sick, it's diseased, or whatever caused it, you know, whatever in the fiction story that you're reading or watching caused it, it's not repairable, it's not fixable. And so their only instinct is to consume and devour and destroy. You know, I think that's actually a great illustration that the world has come up with about their very own nature, about their very own state, apart from Christ. You know, I love what it, it also says this, and I don't necessarily love it, but I love it from the standpoint of, I'm not this way anymore, so I'm going to celebrate it. But it says in the end of verse 3 that they were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Because they are dead, because they're dead in their trespasses and sins, because they can't do anything else but sin, they are under judgment for that sin. And you're like, what kind of sense does that make? What kind of fairness does that make? Um, you know, that's not really what tonight's topic is about. But also, anything God wants to do seems fair to me because he's righteous and just and good and loving. So if he wants to do it that way, that's his call. It's not mine. I'm not God. I probably have a terrible definition of justice and what's right compared to God. But they are by nature, not only are they dead, but they're under his wrath. And then I love this. It says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loves us, even when we were dead. Right? So he's talking to people that used to be this way. We were dead in our trespasses. God made us alive together with Christ. Now, who does he say made them together, live together with him in Christ? Does he say you did it? No. Does he say that I did it? No. He says God made us. God made us to live together with him in Christ. You know, I was joking earlier today that tonight's talk was really going to be a really short talk because the topic is the Holy Spirit's role in salvation, and I could have just done that with one point. Everything. And I'm done. Everything. That's it. But I've got to feel like 40 more minutes, so let's keep going. <laughs> Besides, the Word of God is good. 
All right, well, how do you know that? And Jonathan, besides the fact that it says just there, like God made us alive, how do you know that that work is from God? And here's one of my favorite verses in Scripture. Favorite verses in Scripture, and it's many of your favorite verses in Scriptures too. In verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And you know, I love that verse. Do you know why I love that verse? Because I love it because when I finally understood that verse, there was so much pressure taken off of me. You know, here's, here's the gospel how I understood it. And I don't, I don't think anybody necessarily gave it to me this way. I think I'm just a sinner. And so I hear things with sinful ears, even when it's God's proclaimed truth. And I can twist it and morph it, even if I understood it one time, you know, I can twist it and morph it in my mind and make it idolatrous because I'm just a sinner. But what I understood about the gospel growing up was this, is that to be saved, I needed to understand that Jesus Christ died on a cross for my sin, oh, excuse me, lived a sinless life, died on a cross for my sin, was raised from the dead. And that, if I, and that if I confess with him that he is Lord, then I will be saved, right? And here's what I understood about that. I understood that for me to be saved, I had to say something to God and I had to really, really mean it. And if I didn't really, really mean it, then I could not be saved. Now I'm so thankful God works through my bad theology. I'm, you know, when we get to heaven, you know, he might, it's probably not even going to be worth the time, but I used to imagine we're all going to be pulled into a side room and told what we got wrong. Okay? Because, but, but it doesn't really matter because listen, God is sovereign enough and good enough and loving enough and merciful enough to work through my bad ideas. He's just that powerful. But listen, let me tell you, because I understood the gospel in that way for years, for years I thought, man, am I really saved or not? You know, when I prayed that prayer, did I really mean it? You know, did I mean it enough? Oh man, I sinned today. Uh, does that mean that I'm not a Christian? Or I have this sin in my life that I keep on sinning with God. Am I, am I even saved? I remember one night, 18 years old on a mission trip, you know, uh, pastor's kid, leader of my youth group. I was up till like four in the morning just begging God to let me know if I was really saved. I mean, I was crying. I mean, I was on my face because I was so worried that I had done something wrong or that I missed a step, you know? Now, I go back and look on it, and if you ask me my testimony, and this is true, it's that the Holy Spirit convicted me of my need for Jesus Christ. And my parents just recognized in me the Holy Spirit's conviction of my need for Jesus Christ. And I responded to that. And when I go back and look on it, they really didn't explain, my parents didn't explain to me the gospel in this way. But again, because I'm a sinful person um, and we want to get credit for stuff that God's doing, it's just our nature, we do. And you're like, no, I don't. Yeah, you do. We want to get credit for stuff that God is doing it just became this twisted thought. And listen, like, Satan used that thought for years. And then finally, through the study of Scripture, I came, like so many people, to this verse. You know, and here's what I found. All right, I put up the English part up there, and I put up the Greek part up there. And that's not really so you can know how smart I am or anything like that. It's just because it's important, okay? Because I'm not really, like, that smart or anything. I'm just a normal average <clears throat> whatever I am okay but um see I can't even think of a word for it if Russell was here he'd have like six different words you know and most of them we wouldn't understand I can't even think of a word all right but Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 says for grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of your own doing is the gift of God not a result of works so that no one may boast now what's interesting is that grace in this verse Charity is a dative of means. In other words, grace is the means by which you are saved. Okay? And what's grace? It's something you don't contribute to. Because if you contribute to it, then it's not grace. 
right? And it also says it's through faith. So it's sort of paralleling. Grace is exactly parallel with faith. And why is that important? Well, because it's the same Greek construct, what it's saying is just like you don't do anything to earn this grace, you also didn't do anything to earn this faith, right? And you're like, some of y'all are probably thinking, hey, um, of course, in our church, it's not that big of a deal, but some of y'all are thinking like, hey, this is Calvinism. I'm going to be like, no, this is Christian orthodoxy. And if you think that you did something, you praying a prayer, got you saved, that is not biblical Christianity, right? Or if you think you mustered up enough faith out of your own dead self, that is not biblical Christianity. The only thing that is debated is once God gives you the faith to believe whether or not you can accept or reject that. That's what's debated. But listen, you wouldn't understand the gospel, want to believe the gospel, had to put the faith to put in the gospel if God didn't give it to you. And here's, here's, here's what, and you're like, well, how do you know this? Well, because of the Bible. It says, um, what's interesting here is that grace, oh, I've got a little, oh, look out, sorry. Is that grace and faith are, um, are neuter, are, excuse me, are feminine nouns. Like, somebody in here speaks Spanish. I think Peter does or something. Do you speak Spanish, Peter? Yeah, we all know you do. Uh, he said C. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> well, but in, in, in Spanish, you can correct, I'm point that out because you can correct me if I'm wrong because like we established, I'm not like super smart or anything, right? So in Spanish, you have to have uh, agreement noun with the adjective, right? In gender agreement noun with the adjective, right? So you even have to do that with articles. Like nobody's ever been to a Mexican restaurant called La Chico, you know, because that's wrong. It's El Chico, you know. Um, it's the same way in Greek. Like if the this was going to refer to just the grace, it'd be feminine. If the this was just going to refer to the faith, it's feminine. But what the Bible is getting across is it's not feminine, it's neuter. And what that means is the author made an intentional grammatical change. And why did he do that? Because he wants to get you across that the whole process, all of it, is from God. It's not from you. You are saved by grace through faith. And all of that, all of that is from God. And listen, when I understood that, it just liberated me. Why? Because I finally understood the gospel. And it, it's, you're like, you, well, you can't be saved before you fully understand the gospel. I don't know. Were you saved before you fully understood the Trinity? I think you were, you know? So God can move before I fully understand things. And that's fine. But listen, we got it. It is so important. I'll talk about why here in a minute. But we need to get this right, that the Holy Spirit's work in salvation is to convict us, lead us to repentance, and to grant us the faith to believe the gospel. And you wouldn't want to do that in the first place if God hadn't been moving in your life. But hey, don't take my word for it. All right, there's more. That's a joke for people that are my age. And if you're, you, okay. Anyways, all right. But hey, don't take my work for it. Let's look at some of the words of Jesus. In Mark chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, Jesus says, it says this, And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. You're like, well, Jonathan, what's the point of this verse? Well, Jesus here is talking about why he speaks in parables. And why he speaks in parables is because there are some people who the Holy Spirit will um, enlighten to the meaning of the parable and they will be saved. And there's some people who the Holy Spirit will not enlighten and they'll be saved. How does God choose those people? We could debate that till the cows come home. There's about three or four different answers I could give you. And uh, I'm going to go like mystery. I don't know because I'm not God. Okay. And if you think that's a cop out, man, I should run for office because I'm great at that. I'm going to say mystery about a lot of stuff, you know. 
But listen, it, here, here's what Jesus is getting across, is that a parable, even Jesus' use of the parable is not a riddle or an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. But when Jesus used parables, it's a theological teaching tool and not just a rhetorical teaching tool. In other words, Jesus is using parables to say, look, there are some things that have to be taught by God. There are some things that have to be taught by God. You cannot learn them on your own. Why? Because you're dead in your trespasses and sins. And dead people don't learn things. Dead people don't come to know things apart from what? God who makes them alive. God who makes them alive through his Holy Spirit. You're like, Jonathan, I still don't know if I believe you yet. All right. Well, they didn't like it either. So Jesus is arguing the parable with the Pharisees. He said, Jesus answered, don't grumble among yourselves. In John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him, and I will raise him up on the last day. For it is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Listen, part of the reason Jesus is using parables is because Jesus is being faithful, as a God, divine son, he would be, to Scripture, that when the end times comes, when the Messiah comes, that people will not be taught by their own wisdom, but that people will be taught by God. Jesus here alludes to, um, um, later on in the chapter, alludes to him being lifted up, right? And when he's lifted up, he will draw all people uh, to himself. And that allusion, again, has to do with Moses. But why is Jesus, and this is why I did the gospel thing at the beginning, why do the gospels communicate Jesus as, uh, Jesus as the greater Jacob? Why do the gospels communicate Jesus as the greater Abraham? Why do gospels communicate Jesus as the greater Moses? Because every single one of those men came to God not, because, not on their own initiative, but because God called them. Because God called them out. You know, this is foundational for our understanding of the gospel, and Paul appeals to it in Romans, is that Abraham, he didn't do a thing to deserve to have God call him. But God called him, and he responded by what? By faith. And God credited that to him as righteousness. Moses, did Moses do anything to earn God's favor? Then why did God call him out? Because God wanted to do it. Jacob, man, Jacob was a rat, all right? Actually, let me back up. None of these guys would we hire as a pastor or minister, okay? I'm just telling you. If you looked up their criminal background history, you know, uh, some of their giving status, uh, you know, their marriage history, none of these people are we going to hire as being pastors or preachers, all right? But listen, so but why does God use them? Because it's his desire to do so. We read in Scripture, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will come. And when the Holy Spirit comes, that he will convict of sin. He will convict of sin. In John chapter 16, verse 8, Jesus says, And when he comes, speaking of the other helper, that he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit is going to be the one at the end that will teach. As a matter of fact, that's why, again, that Jesus has to teach. That's why not everybody understood, excuse me, the parables. Not everybody understood who Jesus was. You know, and sometimes when we teach this in the Gospels, we forget what the Gospel is. While we're teaching the Gospels books, we forget the Gospels big G, the Gospel big G. And we say, man, I can't believe they didn't understand who Jesus was. It's just so obvious. Oh, those Pharisees, I can't believe they missed out on Jesus. It's just so obvious. But we shouldn't say that. Because according to Jesus' own words in the Gospels, the reason they don't understand is because God the Father hasn't taught them. God the Father hasn't taught them. The Holy Spirit gives faith. Right? You're saved by grace through faith and that not of yourself. And finally, the Holy Spirit gives faith us new creation life. Just like the Spirit was involved in the first creation, the Spirit is involved in the second creation. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11, it says this, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. You know, in Greek, there's different ways to do an if question, you know? There's different ways. You can construct it like you're looking for a no answer. 
You construct it like you're, I generally don't know. Or you, there's ways you can grammatically construct it in that you're expecting a yes response. You know, I've told my wife several times that I wish she spoke Greek and she could construct her questions in a way that I would know the response that she desired. You know, and yes, I'm still alive. And on good days, she thinks that's funny. And when I pick the wrong day, well, it's quiet for a while. But listen, he constructs this question. He constructs this question expecting a yes response. If the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he does, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your moral bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. And so what role does the Holy Spirit play in our salvation? It is the Holy Spirit that helps us to understand the gospel. The Holy Spirit teaches us. It's the Holy Spirit that, remind, that uh, convicts us. It's the Holy Spirit that leads us to repentance. It's the Holy Spirit that grants us faith. And it's the Holy Spirit that gives us new life. Well, what should be our response to that? Well, the first response I want to say is we should celebrate that. We should celebrate that. If we really understand our dead state before Jesus Christ, we can't help but celebrate that God has decided to let us in on the gospel. To let us in on the gospel. That is just worthy of immense celebration. Immense celebration. You know what? I just want to say this as a, and it just, you know, just to me today, you know, I know that I don't celebrate oftentimes genuinely enough. We can come to church on a Wednesday night and we're going to hear a good Bible study because we come to church on Wednesday nights and we hear good Bible studies. We want to come to church sometimes on Wednesday night and listen to good preaching or good teaching or good instruction because we want to feel like we're a Christian that's learning new things and doing construction. But it has nothing to do sometimes with praising and thanking God. It has nothing to do sometimes with praising and thanking God that if we do learn something new according to God's word, it's God that has taught us. It, it, it's not thanking God that we get to hear his word because it's, it's Holy Spirit it's inspired and it's such a gift to us. You know, we, we, we oftentimes go to worship service and we're not really singing songs because we mean every word. You know, we're singing songs because that's Sunday morning and we're there and that's what we're going to do. You know, and, and, and when we really understand that we were dead, that we could do nothing, that we understood nothing, but now I can sing a lyric to a song and that means something to me. We should get excited. We should get excited. It should be cause for celebration. You know, the world likes to celebrate, don't they? And they invent all kinds of things to celebrate, don't they? I mean, we've got sports like crazy, and I, I'm not saying anything, these things are outright sinful, okay? But we've got sports, uh, we've got art, we've got music, we got TV shows, we got the internet, we got a myriad of things just to, that, to, to use our time on. And not only to use our time on, but look, sometimes we take vacations or we wanna see a new series or we wanna see a new ball game because we're looking for something unexpected to happen. Because we're bored and we wanna recover a sense of, of wonder. You know, if you're lost, I can understand why you'd wanna have a sense of wonder. You know, if I was dead and my only option was to sin or sin and I had no spiritual life, man, I'd be looking for anything to give me a sense of wonder. I'd be looking for a ball game just to see if maybe something would happen that I'd never seen before. And you know what? That make me, might make me feel excited for an hour or two. I remember one of the big sporting events, and I'm sorry, I do like sports, so I'm going to talk about it, but one of the big sporting events I went to in my life uh, was, I'm, I'm from Texas, and so... Sadly enough, I'm a Cowboys fan and a Rangers fan, which means I never get to win anything. But, um, <laughs> but in 2012, the Rangers, I think it was around 2012, the Rangers were in the World Series. 
And my older sister at the time was working for AT&T. And not only was she working for AT&T, but she was doing a pretty good job working for AT&T. And so she got to order uh, AT&T's tickets to the World Series, like first access. So I got to go to a World Series game for 40 bucks. I could have hawked that ticket for 400 bucks. But uh, my dad was going, uh, my granddad was going, my uncle was going, my brother-in-law was going. I thought, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd rather go experience something I never experienced. I want to go experience a World Series game. And so we went to game two of the Texas Rangers versus the, 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 the Giants. And it just pains me that Texas lost to California. I can't stand it any time California wins. A bunch of liberals. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, okay. Well, if that's the only thing I got to aim in on, I must not be doing that great. But, um... <laughs> But here's the thing, is, uh, is, is I remember going to that World Series game, sitting, the, sitting, sitting in our seats. They were good seats. We weren't in the upper deck. We were in the lower deck. I mean, we weren't like prime real estate, you know? That's for George Bush and other people like that, you know? But we were in the lower deck, and, and man, I got to eat a hot, eat a, man, a, a ballpark hot dog just tastes better. Don't ask me why. It just does sometimes, okay? But I got to do all that stuff, and, um, but you know what? I left thinking, and this was on my way to the parking lot. I left thinking, is that really it? Like, was that, is that really the best experience that somebody can have? And listen, I didn't think that a day later. I didn't think that two days later. I thought that on the way to the parking lot. Like, is that all? A bunch of millionaires playing a game they invented? Like, is, not they invented, but a bunch of millionaires playing a game. Like, is that it? And it, uh, that, that sense of wonder, that sense of enjoyment lasted about that long. And I'm glad I only paid 40 bucks of it. It was only worth about 40 minutes. But listen, when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's, that's just worth, well, there's no price you can put on it. It's impossible. Because it was worth divinity. It was worth infinity. It's worth things that we can't understand. And so let's have that sense of wonder and celebration. The next thing that the gospel rightly understood should grant us is comfort. Comfort. You know, when I was a student pastor, and I think a lot of times because of the way that the gospel is proclaimed in a lot of churches, and I don't get me wrong, like God used to come down an aisle and pray a prayer in my life. So I don't think that that's always wrong. But I do think it can sometimes do more harm than good if you don't explain it right. And I'd always have students come up to me and they'd wonder, like, Jonathan, am I really saved? Jonathan, am I actually a Christian? When I prayed a prayer, did I mean it? And it was so good when I rightly understood the gospel to be able to say to them, listen, if, if you didn't know Jesus, you wouldn't even be concerned about it. You, you wouldn't even ask that question. It wouldn't even enter your mind. You wouldn't spend a moment's notice wasting time over whether or not you're saved. And it was so comforting to me to realize that if I, th that when I placed my faith in Jesus Christ, that it was because the Holy Spirit had granted me a faith that I could never have had on my own. Now listen, uh, stats show that about 30% of the people in our churches think that you can choose to follow Jesus like you can choose to pick a number one or a two on a value meal, you know, going through McDonald's. And stats show that about a third of our people in our churches, some, following the gospel to them is something like just rational assent. And I want to say to you what the Bible says, that the demons understand it, and they tremble, but there's no Holy Spirit encounter. There's no change. And so if, if that's you, I just want to say this, like, pray. And we'll pray for you, that God will open up your heart and your mind, and if I could explain it, it wouldn't be worth it. 
but that God would do a work in your life. Do a work in your life so that you could truly know that you know Him. The last thing I want to say this is that the gospel, when rightly understood, should give us a great deal of confidence. Of confidence. Well, confidence in what? Well, first, if you do know Jesus Christ, you'd be confident in your sanctification. Confident in your sanctification. The Bible says that if he began a good work in you, he's going to be faithful to do what? To finish it. Confident in your sanctification. And listen, there are times in life where uh, it's easy to doubt the Lord. You know, I remember I've shared this before, but it just happens to be one of the, the biggest instances of my life thus far. But, um, you know, um, but when, when my dad passed of cancer, there are a few weeks where I had some serious doubt. But in the midst of that, God was gracious enough to show me that I was complaining to him about it. <laughs> you know? And he was big enough to handle it. And, and whatever you're going through, look, if you know the Lord, he's going to bring you through it. And if you allow him to, he will use that time to strengthen you, to grow you. Where guess what? I, I'm not as afraid of the words cancer and death now as I used to be. And I might live to regret that in about a week. I could live to regret that tomorrow. We don't know. But right now, I would feel bad for my wife and kids, but as far as all that goes, bring it on, baby. Because I have confidence in Jesus Christ. The next thing we have confidence is we need to have confidence in the truth. Confidence in the truth. Listen, there are some people who object to Christianity because they have some sort of rational impediment to Christian faith. But I love what one professor used to say to students that were brought to him that doubted the truth of Christianity. He would simply look at them and say, what sin are you unwilling to give up? What sin are you unwilling to give up? You see, the Christian faith isn't based upon our rational assent to something, but it's based upon the fact that the Holy Spirit has done something in your life that changed you. And let me tell you, that's a good enough witness. That is a good enough ground of truth. You know, um, when my wife says she loves me, I take it that she loves me. I can't go investigate it. I can't get at it. Um, I don't know, maybe they can do brain scans now, but I never thought of that. <laughs> but assuming she's not a psychopath, and she's not, or else I'd be dead by now. Um, <laughs> But assuming she's not a psychopath, I just take her word at it that she loves me. And that's good enough. There are certain things in life that we can't get at, that we can't prove, that we can't get to. Matter of fact, most of the things we believe, and you're gonna, some of y'all not, might not believe this, but it's true, but in, in philosophy, which I've studied some, you can't prove uh, rules of logic. You can't prove one plus one equals two. We just kind of know it. You can't prove that we weren't all created five minutes ago with all of our memories intact. We just know that we are. There's a lot of things in life that we can't prove. We just know it. And listen, that's enough. And I, the reason why I think that should give us confidence in the truth is so important because that gives us confidence in sharing our faith. When we realize that the Holy Spirit has done the complete work of saving us, then we understand that when we go to witness to somebody, like Paul says, they're not going to be saved because of our eloquent words of wisdom. Matter of fact, Paul says he didn't come to people with eloquent words of wisdom. And then he goes on in that same letter to show that he could have because he uses a tons of eloquent words of wisdom. But he says, when I first discussed with you, I preached nothing but what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I just want to say to this, why are we so afraid sometimes, are preaching the same thing. Look, it's God that has to open their eyes. It's God that has to teach them. There have been some, some, 
some places where I've been, and you may think and you're here tonight where I've heard the worst sermon of my life. <laughs> but people respond to the gospel. And then there's some, been some places I've been where I've heard what I thought was one of the better sermons of my life, and at the end, there's just crickets. You know why? Because it doesn't have anything to do with that. It has to do with what God chooses to do. And once we really get that through, we'll be confident in sharing the gospel. Finally, and this is something I think we should all be confident in, is we need to understand that the Holy Spirit, when he saves us, doesn't just save us. Or doesn't just save, excuse me, me, an individual. Yes, he saves an individual, but he makes that individual a part of something bigger. When you look at Ephesians chapter 2, he says, such were some of you. And it's not you individual, he's saying it to you, plural. And I love this, what he says in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 2. He says, we are created, we are his workmanship, together, not separate, but together were his workmanship to be displayed. You alone are not his workmanship. I mean, in a way you are. But we together are his full Workmanship. It's the same way Paul uses the metaphor of a body, right? Um, together it is something. And we are put together through the Holy Spirit in Christ. He says that created what? Created in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit places all of us in community, in a spiritual community, in Christ Jesus. And we're that way together, not individual. And then the same corporate body that's been brought together is brought together in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared him for hand. Not that just you should do them by yourself, but that we should walk in them, a church together. And what that should do to us when we understand the gospel rightly is this. It gives us great confidence in the church. It gives us great confidence in the church you know, we accept too much of what the world tells us about the church. The church in America is dying. Man, people have been saying the church is dying for 2,000 years. It's not dead yet. The church in America is dwindling. You know, I'm sure when Paul had like one house church with 20 converts, um, and he saw the church today, he wouldn't be thinking, man, we're losing ground. He wouldn't be thinking that. <laughs> He'd be celebrating. And some of us, we have the same fear. We have a fear in us about our faith and about the church that isn't really from the Lord. It's something that the culture has pressed upon you and you accept that a lie. Let me tell you something about the culture. The Bible calls that the stoichia or the structures, which is another way for darkness. And in the Revelation, it's called Babylon. And the culture is just evil, right? Uh, culture is, is Satan. <laughs> Not all culture. <laughs> all right. But, but the co Soviet construct that we live in, that always has been and it always will be, not necessarily, it's not going to be of the Lord. All right. And so we can't let people put fear on the church. We can't le let other people put fear on the church that somehow we're going to fail, somehow we're going to fold. Somehow we're not going to accomplish our mission. And a lot of times it's not even like that. A lot of times fear on the church is just we're going to say, stay in our safe place in the church and we're not going to do anything out there. Because out there they don't like us. Out there they, they're going to reject us. Um, you know, that's what the medieval church did is they built all these monasteries. And a monastery doesn't look anything like the ministry of Jesus. The ministry of Jesus is out there, walking around, being around the people. And Jesus was confident in his mission because he knew the one that had sent him. And listen, I just want to speak to you and me that we need to have confidence in the church of Jesus Christ. You know, what if it's God's plan for the church in, Jesus, in America to fold because he's going to raise up a revival in another part of the world? What if that's God's plan? I don't know. But I'll tell you what, I'm also not going to spend too much time worrying about it. I'm just going to do what God's told me to do. And I hope that we as a church are just faithful to keep on doing what God has told us to do with celebration, 
with comfort and with confidence.